Coming up on Global Business, China's services sector activity continued to recover as a private gauge showed that services PMI rose to 75, uh, 57.1 in May. A two-decade-long project has created tens of thousands of beautiful villages in East China's Zhejiang province, and we found out what impact it brings. Today is World Environment Day with theme of solutions to plastic pollution and we look into solutions for this global problem. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business, I'm Lily Lu. We start our program with a look at some economic data out of China that were released earlier today. China's services sector activity continued to rise significantly in May, that is according to Caixin PMI, a private sector survey. The services PMI increased to 57.1, that is up 0.7 percentage point from April, representing the second highest expansion since November 2020. The report notes that this growth coincides with a more rapid increase in total new orders, sustained growth in new export business, and reports of stronger market conditions and consumer turnover out. Co-currently, this Haixin Composite PMI, which tracks both manufacturing and services sector, improved from a three-month low of 53.6 in April to signal a sharp, accelerated rise in overall business activity throughout China. And this marks the most pronounced increase in total output since December 2020. As the economy continues to revolve, the sector, services sector is becoming increasingly important, with more and more businesses operating in this space. And to compete in this highly competitive market, companies are looking for ways to improve their efficiency and effectiveness, and digital tools are playing an increasingly important role in achieving this. However, despite the growing importance of digital tools, experts note that the adoption rate of these technologies is still relatively limited. And to address this, they have called for more policy backing and support to encourage businesses to invest in digital tools and ultimately lead to growth in the services industry. Want to rent or buy an apartment, but you are too busy to visit them one by one? Now you have got a convenient option to go. Open an app, fill out your requirement, talk with the real estate agent online, and have an immersive virtual reality room tour. 你好,请问可以帮我们带看一下房间吗?可以,可以,没有问题。咱们现在看的这个房子呢是... customers said this model helped them save much time and efforts to look for an apartment. 反正就现在上班也不是特别方便去实体看房,完了之后就在手机上先看VR看大概,然后呢觉得看得好的我再去线下去看。the VR room is in proportion to the actual object. It's even clearer to visit via VR because you can zoom in to see every detail. About 5 to 10 percent of our customers don't even need to revisit apartments on site and then make their decision to rent or buy. Well, here is just one example of how digital technologies are being applied in China's services sector. In recent years, the rise of payment, food delivery, and online booking platforms have helped numerous sectors go digital. According to the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the services sector's added value is expected to make up almost 60% of the total GDP, with service industry jobs accounting for over half of total employment by 2025. However, there is a significant gap in the digital transformation of the sector, with less than 1% of companies capable of achieving this development. In terms of scale, Enterprises in the service industry generally belong to small and medium-sized enterprises. They usually haven't the vision and awareness to do digital transformation. He added that policies are vital to help smaller-sized companies in the services sector achieve digital transformation. Policies stimulate digital service providers to target SMEs as their clients. The first is to call for digital service providers to give more consideration to providing essential digital services to small and medium-sized enterprises.
raising digital awareness and cultivating digital capabilities. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences Institute of Finance and Economics recently published a research report on the concept of digitalization for China's service industry. The report urges the market to provide more comprehensive digital solutions that can aid companies in achieving digitalization and drive the growth of the sector. Zhu Zhu, CGTN, Beijing. In China's coastal Zhejiang province, tens of thousands of beautiful villages have emerged as part of a two-decade-long project limited, uh, aimed at revitalizing rural areas. And almost all villages in Zhejiang are now connected to standard highways compared to just 40 percent in 2003. Grid upgrades have also led to more stable electricity supplies in rural areas, which has played a pivotal role in the increased development of these villages. Zhejiang's villages are considered highly digital friendly, and since 2003, 47,000 enterprises have emerged in these areas, and this has led to an increase of six times in the disposable income of the people living in those beautiful villages. And moreover, income disparity in Zhejiang has continued to narrow over the past two decades. Well, it's been a year since Zhejiang province launched a project to transform its rural island into an attractive living space. Common prosperity, with a goal to reduce development gaps between urban and rural areas, is emerging with some local traits. Take a look. Dongju Island, part of Zhou Shan's Dinghai district, is one of the first 12 pioneer islands in the Hello Zhou Shan campaign. The island recently introduced the Huan Shi, a local bookstore that is also an internet sensation. Zhang Hongying, who's the manager of the bookstore and was born on Dongju Island, went to big cities to pursue her dream like many young people. However, as the island was transformed, Zhang decided to come back. The camping site has become an internet sensation, bringing many more visitors to the island. The camping site Zhang is talking about is Jian Shan Hai, an island campsite which is the core component in Dongju Island's publicity campaign. The base hosted the Ding Hai stop of the 2023 Island Live Festival, which attracted over 100 tourists and camping fans to enjoy music and the beauty of nature. Within a year of the launch, 150 industries, infrastructure, and livelihood projects were started on the 12 islands with the aim of increasing the income of fishermen and farmers, and ultimately, strengthen the collective economy. Among them, 64 were completed already. 15 key Hello Zhou Shan projects with a total value of 1.328 billion yuan were signed at the thematic conference on the first anniversary of the Hello Zhou Shan Actions for Island Common Prosperity. Sea Trip, a major travel platform, will invest 69 million yuan with Zhou Shan Tourism Group to start the Sea Trip Holiday Farm on Bai Sha Island, a part of Zhou Shan's Putuo District. Hello Zhou Shan is a brilliant brand for today's Yon the River Delta. It helps to upgrade the tourism industry's plans, fills a gap in island tourism, and enhances the ecosystem. The campaign is a response to the nation's expectations for quality tourism. We're looking forward to bringing the brand out of China. Zhou Shan City launched the Hello Zhou Shan Actions of Island Common Prosperity Project in June 2022 when the first batch of projects on 12 islands were signed. The action plan spans three years, focusing on 30 outlying islands, and is designed to explore a new pattern of rural revitalization and common prosperity on islands with Zhou Shan characteristics by upholding the diverse beauty of the island while promoting shared growth. A total of 155 projects has been launched in industry, infrastructure, and livelihood with an accumulated planned investment of 1.52 billion yuan in the Pioneer Islands during the first year. So far, 64 projects were completed with 730 million yuan of investment. Also, service reforms in 102 matters of concern for local people were implemented to benefit 50,000 island residents.
And now to understand more about the efforts taken by China to protect uh, the rural environment and how provinces like Zhejiang are launching projects to promote common prosperity projects, we're now joined by Mr. Chu Chiang, who is a research fellow at Beijing Foreign Studies University, and also he is a consultant for the International Poverty Reduction Center in China. Mr. Xu, great to have you on the show, as always. Could you tell us more about the impact of the project on the lives of farmers and the fundamental changes it has brought about in the thousands of beautiful villages that's been created well if you are you know part of our team if you witness the changes in the past 10 years you understand there are too many stories to share with you well many years ago when we go to Zhejiang provinces we find there are many problems even by that time Zhejiang province is already one of the richest province in the whole China but if you go there go to many rural places you find first of all the toilet the toilet can be very shabby, uh, the old Japanese toilet style. It's not very clean, and people have a lot of trouble to go to the toilet and enjoy all kinds of services. So President Xi Jinping said, uh, we must make some change to it. We must let everybody to use the uh, modernized, handy, clean toilet. So, and then the revolution happened. Now you go to all kinds of, even as far as the farthest uh, remote area in the Zhejiang province, you find everyone will have the highest standard in their, you know, uh, the cleaning and also the toilet. And more than that, if you go to another village called the Pujang village, and those area used to, you know, seek for the wells. So they want to have, you know, more modern factories, a big, you know, chemical businesses, uh, the stone mills, that can bring uh, people, you know, wealth and money. But guess what? They toxicated basically all the rivers inside of the village and the county. People do get the money and a higher salary, but guess what? The externality really can be a great damage. People get sick, chronic diseases, and then we say it cannot be like that forever. And we just moved away all the big, uh, big factories, chemical businesses, and we replaced it with the tourism, uh, with the household of BMB, culture park, anything like that. And we find out everything becomes clean, beautiful, lush mountains, clean creeks, and also people do not get poor. People find out this culture businesses, tourism business can also become a very good source for the family income. And more than that, you gather people to these places. More people would like to come to the rural area and also education, culture development are also there. People get more healthy, so we call it a win-win and win. It's a comprehensive progress made by this project. No, these are great stories that you just shared with us. And let's learn more about how initiatives like this are contributing to the Beautiful China Initiative, because we know the Beautiful China Initiative not only aims for China uh, to promote its own sustainable development, but also for China to fulfill its part of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Yes, exactly. You know, actually, this village project is just a part of the big story. Recently, probably do not notice that in China, we have a very important conference. In the conference, President Xi Jinping just mentioned a very important concept called China-style modernization and Chinese culture. What does that even mean? And what's the meaning of that with the UN progress and the target? Well, in this concept, China mentioned what is the Chinese side modernization. One part of it is, uh, you know, harmonious development between man and nature. Another is common prosperity. A lot of people say, okay, hold on a minute. That's a conflicting target. It's not going to work together at the same time, right? Because if you want clean development, it means you're rejecting the factories, uh, big heavy industries, and etc. And uh, how can people get rich and common prosperity? But this project in Zhejiang province actually showed that do work together. Because in China, we have a saying called the lush mountain with the forests and the creeks, or also gold mountains with wells. That shows because the service industry, culture industry, tourism can also bring people wells, but also in a healthy and uh, you know sustainable way and with less externality. And also the trickling down effect is much less than the big industry. So in a city, yes, we do have a modernized industry, but in the rural area, we try to develop this kind of a family-oriented, you know, uh, personal, uh, friendly income kind of a business, a service industry. So it all work together. And then Zhejiang showed every uh, province else in China that it does work. In the rural area, we do not need to destroy the forest. We do not have to introduce in, you know, heavy polluting industries, but still we can be, make people rich and happy and long-lasting. 
And also, I think there can be, uh, you know, a bigger picture that is in the rest of the world. We can all adopt this kind of the concept that is Chinese style modernization and its connotation. Yes, projects like this are very inspiring for other parts of the world as well. And also today marks the World Environment Day, which is an important global platform for promoting environmental awareness. Uh, do you think that it has played its role? And how is this related to poverty alleviation efforts? Of course. Well, these day actually is not a, uh, you know, does not have a very long history. But uh, just to take a look at the uh, past few years, all this concept, uh, all these uh, uh, all these kind of you know slogans they have made actually become the very good inspiration and a reminder for the rest rest of the world. Yes, we do need to make a development in the economy, but also we need to be careful for the externality, which is the consequences caused by the economic development. We do want to have higher income, but not at the cost of our environment, not at the cost of our health. And in the current years, you know, in Stockholm, we mentioned about water issues. And also in Kunming, we mentioned about the biodiversity. And those small pieces of jig puzzles now form a bigger picture, are guiding all, all human beings marching towards a correct direction. And now, just take a look. Uh, Kunming and Montreal framework has already been serving the whole world, become the new target of the whole human being. And I think with this guidance, people are not marching towards a blind target with only economy and income or yes. the wealth, but also people treat it in a more comprehensive and a holistic view. Mm -hmm. Great insights. Thank you so much, Mr. Chi Chang. Thank you. And up next here on Global Business, today is World Environment Day with the theme of solutions to plastic pollution, and we're looking to solutions for this global problem. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz talk. Only on CGTN. Today is World Environment Day with the theme of solutions to plastic pollution. Last week, representatives from nearly 180 countries met in Paris to discuss a UN treaty to end plastic pollution. China's 14 5 year plan calls for better recycling of wasted plastic and promotion of alternative green materials. But as Timothy Pope reports, the problem is a global one and is proving hard to solve. Despite knowing for years that we need to reduce our reliance on plastics, they're still almost impossible to escape in everyday life. According to data provider Statista, more than half a billion people across China use online food delivery services. That's tens to hundreds of millions of packages like this one being opened every day. And as you can see, plastic packaging is the norm. Every single day, 30,000 tons of plastic leaks into the ocean. Zhang Yimo is the Beijing-based director of the World Wildlife Fund's Oceans and Plastics program. He says the work being done by the UN member nations is crucial. It was a plan that after five sessions of international negotiation committees discussion that we hopefully can get an ambitious treaty that, that aims to end up and the plastic pollution for, uh, for the global, for, for the world. In 2021, China banned plastic drinking straws and single-use plastic bags. So are incentives and pleas to be more mindful of the environment enough to turn companies away from so much unnecessary plastic? Li Yue from PwC says globally there are more sustainability standards requiring companies to take action. The companies need to conduct a thorough life cycle assessment uh, of the alternative solutions to see if um, uh, 
if it's actually a better alternative solution uh, in terms of the environmental impact and the social impact. And also the company need to conduct financial assessment to, uh, to see if they can afford it. In 2019, the WWF put the total societal cost of a single year's global plastic production at 3.7 trillion US dollars. But the financial costs of switching to more environmentally friendly materials are still more easily borne by larger companies. WWF says more attention needs to be focused on the smaller companies which make up the bulk of the Chinese economy to help them ditch plastics too. We know that there's economic uncertainty and uh, it, might be, it might cause difficulties for a company just to switch to use other substitutes of uh, single-use plastic. But I think we can also take this as an opportunity to reduce the, the costs and uh, find, even find more business opportunities from that. We're seeing um, more and more uh, consumers, customers in China, uh, uh, they, they have uh, uh, raised uh, awareness uh, in, in plastic pollutions and uh, I think uh, the company is also seeing that and they are aware of that and that's one of the main reasons they are taking actions. The decision to prioritise the environment and say no to unnecessary plastic is ultimately everyone's to make. Timothy Pope, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. And last Friday, Argentine Economy Minister Sergio Massa visited China with the aim of renewing the currency swap agreement between the two countries. And by doing so, the country can benefit from improved economic stability. Our reporter Olivia He has more about Massa's visit and the potential impact of renewing the currency swap agreement. What specific opportunities do you see for Argentine businesses and industries to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative through partnerships with Chinese companies? Given Argentina's infrastructure and energy development needs, there are numerous opportunities for partnerships between Argentine and Chinese companies under the Belt and Road Initiative. For instance, restoring Argentina's railway network with the help of Chinese firms with expertise in infrastructure construction could increase transport capacity and reduce costs. Moreover, partnerships on wind and solar power projects in areas with good sunlight and strong wind have potential to address electricity shortages during peak consumption periods. Additionally, given Argentina's uranium resources and existing nuclear power plants, there may be potential for cooperation on nuclear energy development. What's your perspective on the significance of Argentina's currency swap agreement with China for the country's current economic condition, and how does Argentina plan to utilize the funds? The current economic conditions in Argentina are challenging, as the country's external debt remains high and shortages of US dollars have been a persistent issue in recent years. The recent dry weather has further worsened the situation by impacting the agricultural harvests, which are a significant source of export revenue. Against this backdrop, the renewal of the currency swap agreement with China has significant implications for Argentina. Under the agreement, Argentina can access $10 billion in discretionary renminbi, which can be used for trade activities with China without depleting the scarce US dollar reserves. This will ease the pressure on the foreign exchange reserves held by the Argentine Central Bank, and the safe dollars can be utilized for critical operations such as managing currency exchange rates. This renewal provides Argentina with three key benefits. Firstly, it saves the limited U.S. dollar reserves. Secondly, it indirectly boosts the U.S. dollar income as China's imports from Argentina will still need to be paid in U.S. dollars. And thirdly, it enhances market confidence and better equips Argentina to deal with future U.S. dollar shortages. With the growing use of RMB in Argentina, how does the country plan to enhance its financial cooperation and trade with RMB in the future? The China-Argentina Currency Swap Agreement was initiated in 2009 and has been renewed multiple times since then with an ever-increasing amount. It has significantly contributed to maintaining Argentina's financial stability. One key aspect of financial cooperation is the development of RMB clearing business, indicating that RMB is becoming more crucial in Argentina's economic ecosystem. Going forward, it is anticipated that the RMB will become a vital reserve currency in Argentina, with potential implications for enhancing economic and trade cooperation between China and Argentina. 
The rise of small stores in Chinese cities is transforming urban life, with Shanghai, a major consumer hub, becoming a popular destination for small business owners. Our reporter Zhang Shixuan recently visited a newly opened Park Hour training store in Shanghai to learn more about how the founder stepped out of her comfort zone. Running, vaulting, jumping, climbing, and rolling. A series of fast movements to traverse obstacles called parkour. And it all happens in this 200 square meter exercise center in Shanghai's Huangpu district. Xia Pengming started her professional life in the banking industry but switched careers two years ago, opening a center in Jing'an. This new one is three times the size of the first. I'm fulfilling my childhood dream. I had reached a plateau in my previous job, and I didn't feel like an ordinary life of office work. I just wanted to take this chance and have a try. I got my first batch of customers in just the first month after opening, and since then, I'd been thinking of having a bigger setup. And then this newly opened sports-themed shopping mall reached out to us. The membership in her centers has now tripled from what it was at the beginning. Most of members are between 20 and 35 and work in a variety of industries. The newly opened stores now are not just limited to the restaurants, cafes, tea houses or accessory shops that are easily available along the city streets downtown. The founders are now digging into some really new and niche markets, looking for the special customers, just like this one, the parkour training store. Small restaurants have a lot of competition, so they usually have promotion costs. But for us, we don't have much competition, so our promotion costs are a lot smaller. It's been a year now. I have made many friends here, as we share a common hobby, so we have a lot to talk about. This is my first time seeing a small shop like this. It's safer than training outdoors, and I can have a professional tutor here. I'm at a management position in manufacturing industry, so I spend lots of time in the office. Exercise helps me relax and forget about work. I've met seven or eight new girlfriends here. We usually go out together now. Both of the parkour training centers were open during the COVID outbreak, a time when many would have been worried about starting a new business. But it turned out this young lady was pretty confident about her prospects. The pandemic seemed to me like one of those things you can't avoid. So I wasn't about to give up my dreams because of those worries. It took around six months for me to get back all my costs for my first store, and this one, probably I will have made back the costs after the summer vacation. I should say it's a really unique experience compared with the majority of the small stores I've been visiting. It's full of challenges, yet gives you a feeling of relief from the busy city life. And though small, the center has been attracting more employees. This is my first time working in such a small place. They treat you better. And as the name of center No Limits would suggest, it's enabled the founder and her customers to leap out of their comfort zones and not worry about their limits. And that's perhaps the real lessons of small shop operations. In the first quarter of this year, more than 30,000 new small shops opened in Shanghai. That's according to data from Meituan. And in March alone, the number of newly opened small stores in the city jumped more than 40% from the previous month. The recovering consumption is the engine behind them. Zhang Shuxuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. And that'll do for this edition of Global Business. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Lu in Beijing. Bye for now.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network.